have multiple different kind of buckets we play in. We're specifically from the technology group. So we work with both clients and candidates in a temporary or permanent capacity when it comes to opportunities in the tech space. So tech hiring, especially in Boston, many other markets, but Boston especially has shifted into high gear. There's a reason we're all here as companies spending money on booths and getting in front of candidates and trying to get people attracted to us. It's because the tech talent out there is limited and there's a lot of us looking for them. So a lot of people are calling it a war on talent or um, you know, candidate driven marketplace, whichever it is. You know, there's a reason to make sure that we're doing our recruiting strategies correctly and most optimal. Yeah, and just to even expand on that, I know for some of you companies that probably even post jobs, you know, the applicants that we're finding are having the most success placing are more passive candidates. So we're not really seeing, you know, really, really strong candidates. They don't have their resumes up on Monster. You know, they're getting calls at their desk from recruiters about opportunities. So when it comes to talent, even these days posting a job and just sitting back and letting the post bring in all the good talent, that uh, it's not really that market. I think some companies probably have better success depending on what their culture is, the reputation, and kind of the, the city or the industry. But right now, good people are tough to come by, so we're definitely seeing that. Um, and to expand on that, so what we're seeing a lot of competition do, and this is really across the board, not even industry specific, um, is they're getting creative on how they're trying to bring folks in and what they're offering. So some of the things we're seeing is, and you know, I know we do it internally for uh, employees at our company, referral bonuses. So. You'll hear a saying, good people know good people. We've seen companies come up, you know, anywhere from $1,000. There's some companies we've heard that are offering three, dollars $4,000 to their internal staff for anybody that they know that could be, you know, relevant for what they do. So typically those are paid out after 90 days in the seat. Um, obviously some startups specifically, they're coming up with different offers as far as working from home, um, beer in the office, ping pong tables, creative cultures. So there's all types of internal pitches outside of technologies being used within the office and then you know your traditional work uh, hours. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Do you have any data or are you, uh, have you looked at any data about uh, any particular job boards that are either doing better than others or that are floundering that are you know, anything along those lines? I'd be making it up if I tried to quote some right. specific. Um, you know, I can, so, in our per, Mark's in our permanent placement team. I'm the, the branch manager of recruiting for our temporary and project-based needs. So typically, I, you know, Mark can speak upon it, but it's tough where... In terms of job posting boards, I'm sure the reason you're asking is you see exactly what we see when we post a job. You probably get a thousand responses, but you probably don't get anywhere more than one or two that might even be a fit. So you spend a lot of time going through those responses, the inbound coming off the job boards. Um, we will get to it. Obviously, the best job board you have is your internal website. If you already have somebody on your website and they're interested in your company for whatever reason, you know, let them know if there's a position for them there. So that's really what I would say and what I've seen is the best one. Job boards themselves, I, I don't think we've done any data or seen anything. Yeah, when it comes to direct hire roles, which most companies are looking for as the person that's going to be there, you know, next month, next year, three years from now, it's tough for us to go out and try to pull somebody off Monster. You're not going to find, you know, a CS degree from Worcester Polytech and three years at the same company that's just waiting for, you know, somebody to call them. There's people that, you know, are just, there's other avenues that agencies are using to identify these people and, and good people typically really don't even need to put a resume up online. Through right. word of mouth, through their own personal network, or through an agency trying to track them down, um, they're getting a lot of activity. So, um, and we'll talk more about it as we go deeper in, but just across the board, so starting salaries for tech positions in the United States are actually up 5.3% uh, this year. I think some of the bigger roles that we're seeing here locally, and it's probably a national trend as well, um, web development, software engineering, mobile development, we were actually just talking about a DevOps we're seeing is a big push and, and the salaries are coming with it. Um, architecture, but from the, the core skills, I would say those three roles are, are probably the hottest out there right now. Not only higher salaries, um, just expectation to fill a role on somebody's team. I would even argue that this is on the light side, so I 
don't know where our company came up with this data that a staff level position was for five weeks. I think if you're looking in the engineering space and you can fill a staff level position in five weeks, given a two week notice as well that the person's working, I think you did pretty good. Um, seven weeks for a management level, again, if they're currently in a seat and you're pulling them into your company, arguably much longer. So um, a lot of the reason why the recommendation is to almost, again, have the positions on your website, always be looking, always be recruiting if, if you will, because with, you never know if the seat's going to open and if you have it open for seven, 10, however many weeks, the workload that's spread to the rest of the team. And then on top of that too, I think, just to stay on this slide for one second, we're seeing a lot of counter offers um, these days. So, you know, we work with somebody, they're looking to make a move, they go and get the dollar amount that they're looking for or get closer to home or whatever their specific reason for looking for a new opportunity is. Companies don't want to lose good people. So we're seeing, you know, outrageous counter offers coming in. So clients aren't <coughs> losing the talent that they have internally. Um, we can always talk more about a whole counter offer scenario later on in the deck, but the ultimate message here is one, <coughs> finding good people takes time. And then when you do find them, companies don't want to lose the people that they have. So they're coming up with a lot of different ways to try to entice these people to stay in the seat. Um, so as far as attracting top candidates here, um, like Mark mentioned, pipelining people will take the long-term approach of when we're looking for roles, we talk to a lot of people. Uh, if they're not applicable to the job that we're staffing for today, it's great we maintain relationships. An entry-level developer right now in three, two, three years could be you know, a great fit for a job that we have. Maybe they're not the, that person right now, but if you build a relationship, if you're staying in touch with these people, you're truly pipelining the talent that you're looking for. Um, folks do develop in their careers. They, they take different opportunities, but if you're kind of taking that long-term approach, that's ultimately going to help you as far as identifying people and, and circling back and building a network. Um, again, just networking and encouraging employee referrals, as we mentioned earlier, good people know good people. If you have somebody on your team that, you know, is a valuable asset to the team, whatever you can do to bring their past in, back into it, you know, if they've worked with somebody that they would recommend as a rock star, obviously that only goes so far. And once people move and exhaust their networks, um, again, that's where we always hear it's the best when you get an internal referral. You trust the person, you know them, they already know people on the team. Other things, just attracting people to the company, whether it's you guys are having internal events, if you can attract prospective candidates to that, um, you know, always good to get your name out there. Obviously, again, we're all here doing something similar, so. <laughs> and then this is just along the same lines of attracting, so exploiting your own website. So. What a company has for a website, clearly, you know, there's probably web developers in here, folks that work on developing these sites and kind of optimizing their not only look but their uh, their searchability. But we see it, you know, on our end, you know, when we're working with clients and they refer us back to a website for where they've got their job posted for opportunities. Um, some companies are better than others. Some companies have fantastic websites. Our candidates that we work with, candidates in the marketplace, go to these things. They do research. They want to look at you know, what, how the company is presenting themselves, what type of culture they preach. So when a company has a site that's average at best, you know, that's a pretty poor first impression. And on top of that, if you've got somebody that needs to search around to try to figure out where the job opportunities are, sometimes you have clients that have it you know, bottom left-hand corner in an awkward font that you can barely tell. You know, they're even trying to list some of the open positions that you're trying to fill. So taking advantage of your website, it's a pretty obvious one, but it goes a long way as far as the initial, uh, you know, kind of interaction a, client, a candidate would have with your company. Writing a clear job description obviously would make sense. Um, can't tell you how many times between one way or the other, too much or too little. You can see, and it really either confuses somebody into making them think that they're not the right fit for your company, or just doesn't give them enough information to get excited about your company. Um, I mean, obviously, an example: if you're looking for a Ruby on Rails developer, and you put every single skill set that could be great for them to have, they may not think they're a fit. But if you just leave it as looking for a Ruby on Rails developer, 
there's really nothing there to get any interest. So a pretty happy medium about what skills you're looking for, utilizing the job description to really sell the company, sell the team, sell the brand that you guys have created. I imagine this doesn't happen as much in the startups where it's the room we're speaking to here, but we'll have clients that will refer back to a job description that's three years old. Um, or you know, it's, it's always worth the time to come up with something. If it's an HR component, sit down with the actual hiring managers and really understand what the technologies are, specifically what this person's doing. Um, because we'll have candidates that are sharp, that will look at, you know, we'll get over uh, a description that a client gave to us and they'll read it and they'll be like, yeah, I don't, what do they want? Like, what are they actually looking for? And then we'll have to go back if we're dealing with HR. It's a really, it's a tough sell for us to be like, I know it's an extra 30 minutes or an hour, but can you please come up with something? Even the candidates we're talking to aren't clear on what you guys are looking for. Um, sometimes we'll have candidates that do phone screens with non-technical clients. It might be a town acquisition person or HR. And it's an awkward first call because, you know, before you can even get a candidate in front of the client, We've got somebody that doesn't have any technical backgrounds that might be judging off someone paused for an extra five seconds in between, you know, an answer. And that's determining whether or not they're going to go on site. So when everything's laid out clear and concise, it's, a, it's easier for the client, uh, if you are working with an agency or the actual candidate, to fully understand what they're getting into and what the expectations are. Little shameless self-promotion, um, working with a staffing agency. I think obviously everybody's first reaction is wanting to fill a position without working with a staffing agency. Um, it's no lie that there's cons that come with using a staffing agency, aka cost that comes along with it. Um, if you are going to use a staffing agency, obviously ourselves being a specialized staffing agency, highly recommended. Um, the difference there is that there are agencies out there that work on absolutely everything, work nationwide. Um, the example here, you know, Robert Half, we have. 300 office locations nationwide. We work only in Boston. We work only on technology. Um, I'm not recruiting any finance people in California, so I'm very local. Um, that's the recommendation there, is that obviously there's pluses and minuses, but as long as you're working with somebody specialized that really understands the technology, understands the development, understands the team that you guys are working with, you can get some more success out of it. And we'll have, just to again elaborate on that, we'll have conversations with clients and candidates. When salary expectations are off, if you've got a client that's looking for, you know, a senior level software engineer and they've got a budget of 75 to 90K that they want to pay on the perm side, we'll have those conversations with clients and say, hey, look, we can show you what type of candidate's available in that range, but just to set appropriate expectations, we're seeing, you know, salary ranges and you could know more than, but 125 to 140, I know people have been placed 200 plus K for, you know, team leads. So knowing, working with a company that knows your specific location in this case, <coughs> for us it's uh, Boston, is extremely helpful from, you know, kind of cutting through the, the fat, so to speak, as far as finding somebody quickly instead of presenting all these candidates that are way too expensive, too well, or anything in between, so. So this is just going to go next slide to more. A couple, couple techniques. These are pretty quick. We'll see a lot of quotes up here, so we can go through them pretty quickly. Um, this one I do think is pretty important, though. Personality trumps IT-specific knowledge every time. I think there's obviously a blend there. You're not going to take somebody with a great personality that doesn't know anything about technology. But we've all either said or heard at one point that they need to be a fit with the team or a culture fit or fit with our group. Um, the biggest question is always, what does that mean? Um, <coughs> What is your group? And going back to using specialized recruiting agencies, if you are going to go that route, um, you know, get somebody that is willing to spend the time to actually go to your office. Because if it is that much of a big deal that you need to find somebody that has the soft skills or is going to be a fit with the team, they need to understand what the team looks like, what that team dynamic feels like, you know, who they're going to be joining. Because otherwise, they're just telling the candidates that you need to be a culture fit, obviously. And in the startup role, it's probably more specific to smaller teams and everybody blending. You don't want to have somebody that, you know, has the technical skills, but it just the feel is not right in the office place. So to Mark's point, we encourage clients to meet them face to face, bring them into your office, let them see the environment, do it again, do it multiple times. So everybody's comfortable, everybody knows what they're getting into. Um, no, 
don't need to dig too much in this, but again, employee personal networks. Um, if you're pipelining candidates over a multiple year scenario, you're going to see people that could be a fit in a couple years for the jobs that you have now. If you're talking to the folks that you have on your team and really encouraging them, who do they know, you know, coming up with different ways. Mark had mentioned it too, like a pizza and beer night where you're inviting friends of your internal staff in. Um, you never know who's going to come in, who could be a fit. It could just it's a, it's a good long-term play. Again, just quickly, internal network. If you have a strong internal network, be personal with it. Um, that's really what this is saying. Keep moving through it. So from an interview perspective, um, Every company is different. Sometimes there are companies that are in a pinch and they need to hire and they want to get somebody in the seat and they'll maybe move the process. Again, from a, a startup perspective, I think finding the right person, 